Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Sarah Fee, Senior Curator of Global Fashion and Textiles here at the Royal Ontario Museum. And I'm delighted you can join us today for our ROM Connects program. I'd like to begin by acknowledging that the ROM sits on the ancestral lands of the Wendat, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Anishinaabeg Nation, including the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation, since time immemorial to today. Today's event is presented by the Veronica Jervers Research Fellowship. The Research Fellowship is supported by a memorial fund established in 1979 to commemorate the noted ROM curator and textile scholar, Veronica Jervers. This fund seeks to promote scholarly research on the ROM's own textile and fashions collection, which number over 50,000 items. The Veronica Jervis Fellowship is open to PhD candidates and international scholars whose research can make direct use of and support any part of the museum's collections. Successful candidates are selected by a committee of both museum and university scholars. My colleague, Senior Curator Dr. Alexandra Palmer here at the ROM, chairs this committee and was herself a former Veronica Gerber's Fellow. So I am delighted today to welcome the 2022 Veronica Gerber's Fellow, Bronte Hebden, who will share her findings and research with the fellowship. Welcome, Bronte. Bronte Hebden is Theodore Rousseau Fellow and PhD candidate at the Institute of Fine Arts, New York University. She graduated with distinction from the Institute of Fine Arts in 2018 with her MA thesis titled, Cockades, Cravats and Hot Pants, Aesthetic Politics and the Visual Language at a Citizenship During the French Directory. And I hope we get to hear more about the hot pants. Her in-progress PhD dissertation at the Institute examines collaborations between artists and fashion designers at Napoleon Bonaparte's court. Thank you for being with us today, Bronte. Thank you for having me. And after her talk, Bronte will be joined by fashion historian Alexandra Kim for a short discussion exploring Bronte's topic and the impact of the Veronica Jervis Fellowship on emerging professionals. Welcome, Alexandra. Alexandra Kim is a museum professional working with the City of Toronto as administrator for Spadina Museum and Mackenzie House. She is a dress and textile specialist and her previous roles have involved working as a curator with the dress collection at Kensington Palace. She is co-author of the book, The Dress Detective with Ingrid Maida, and currently is co-editor of Costume, the Journal of the UK Costume Society. She is an associate of the Global Fashion and Textile section here at the ROM and has taught at Ryerson University, Seneca College, and the University of Toronto. Now, throughout our program, I encourage you to put any questions you might have for Bronte in the Q&A feature, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen, and we will be live to answer your questions at the end of today's program. Um, so let us please welcome Bronte to share her experiences and findings as the 2022 Veronica Gerber's Research Fellow. And so just to remind everyone again, Bronte will speak for about 30 minutes on her research topic, after which time she and Alexandra Kim will discuss this and other topics and answer your questions. So with that, I will turn um, things over to Bronte. Okay, thank you so much, Sarah. And thank you, Alexandra, and everyone at the Royal Ontario Museum. I am delighted to be here with you all today to share a little bit about my research and what kept me very busy at the ROM in this past October. Um, my doctoral dissertation at the Institute of Fine Arts at New York University combines art and fashion of the early Napoleonic Empire. I aim to understand how men's court costumes through their cut, their color, and their embroidery, all combined together to make court fashion a wearable tool of imperial and cultural domination for Napoleon, particularly as he enlarged the boundaries of the French Empire into Italy between 1804 and 1805. 
My remarks today will speak particularly about the oak, the laurel, and the peacock, the politics of men's historical fashion in this period. But personal presentation was always important to Napoleon. When he was proclaimed emperor by the French Senate in May 1804, one of the first things he did to prepare for his coronation was to assign his Grand Master of Ceremonies, Louis-Philippe de Ségur, to design court costumes for his regime. Through studying this history, I uncovered a beautiful man's coat dated to 1806, <clears throat> held in the collection of the Royal Ontario Museum. The coat is made of red fold wool and has silk embroidery running along the collar, down the breast, and along the hemline. There are nine buttons on the right side, but only three buttonholes on the left. The badge of the Italian Order of the Iron Crown is visible there on the left breast as well. When the coat came to the Rom in 1908, it was said to have been worn by Andrew Darling, Napoleon's coffin maker. But that attribution was ambiguous as there was little documentation to support Darling's ownership. As the Veronica Jervers Research Fellow in Textile and Fashion History, I came to the Rom to see if this coat fit into the scope of my dissertation project. To ask questions like, why does this coat have embroidered peacock feathers on it? How does this coat compare with Napoleonic coats and suits that survive in other collections around the world? And could this coat be an example of imperial propaganda? The coat's geographic connection to France and to Italy, its very unique embroidery and its dating to 1806, I'll make it the ideal piece for me to ask these questions. The Napoleonic Empire began on December 2nd, 1804, when Napoleon Bonaparte became emperor of the French in a lavish coronation ceremony in Notre Dame Cathedral. Hundreds of men and women crowded the aisles of the cathedral, vying for a chance to see Napoleon infamously snatch the crown away from Pope Pius VII and crown himself. The moment that artist Jacques-Louis David chose to depict in his painting, however, occurs just after this. Here you can see Napoleon already wears his crown as he reaches down to crown his wife, Josephine. This motion creates the principal action in the painting and acknowledges the key purpose of his coronation to reestablish a French hereditary monarchy. And as art, hist art historian Susan Siegfried has said, to quote, invent a new tradition. Why invent a new tradition? Well, in the bloody aftermath of the French Revolution, the demise of King Louis XVI and Marie Antoinette brought on a period of intense political instability. Constitution after constitution written, government after government formed, and at least until the young General Napoleon Bonaparte burst into public consciousness, no one, not even Maximilien Robespierre, had been able to staunch the political bleeding. <clears throat> Napoleon's coronation was thus, on the one hand, an attempt to look forward, to invent a new government and a new social order for France, while simultaneously his coronation attempted to look back, beyond the revolution, to an earlier golden age of political stability in Europe. And this new tradition is visible, written and encoded within the many court costumes that you see worn in David's painting. So let's look at Napoleon's costume more carefully. Napoleon is wearing a long white tunic under a velvet and ermine robe. He has a sash at his waist, as well as a sword and slippers on his feet. Each of the, these pieces is an intentional nod to the great French kings of the past. The long ermine robe is a garment typically associated with the coronation of French kings. The long white tunic, a historicized and anachronistic nod to fashionable tunics in medieval France. Looking even closer, notice the embroidered bees peppering the ermine robe. 
This is a direct reference to the tomb of the Merovingian king Childeric, whose grave was uncovered and dismantled in 1653 and was found to contain hundreds of gold bees. When viewed all together, this ensemble is thus an example of a grand habit de corps, or great coronation costume. But a court costume is different from the average man's suit of clothes. Court costumes were historicized visual markers of their regime's hereditary authority and power. They were highly symbolic and were worn for important events like marriages, baptisms, and of course, coronations. For a king or an emperor, this grand habit de corps court costume was a long ermine robe, often embroidered with the fleur-de-lis, the lily of the French monarchy, and a historicized garment underneath, in addition to their accessories of power, such as swords, crowns, etc. We can see this in two portraits of 17th and 18th century French kings, Louis XVI depicted here in 1779 and Louis XIV depicted in 1701. It's important to note that court costumes were not supposed to be fashionable. Under their long ermine robes, instead of the fashionable male silhouette of the 17th or 18th century, which at the time would have been a three-piece suit, consisting of a coat, waistcoat, and breeches. Instead, both of our Louis here wear 16th century doublets and trunk hose, a historicized version of what their ancestor Henry IV, the first Bourbon king would have worn. You can see how Napoleon here in the center tries to mimic their costume, but perhaps unwilling to look so directly similar to these Bourbon monarchs, his tunic reverts back to the style of dress popular among medieval Merovingian kings, such as Childeric or even Charlemagne. Importantly though, Napoleon wore this grand habit de corps only for his coronation ceremony. He changed immediately afterwards into a petit habit de corps, and again looked back to courtly precedent of the 18th century. These petite habits de corps, smaller in scale, though just as sumptuous, were worn for daily court activities throughout the 17th and 18th centuries. They were also much more in line with contemporary fashion. For Louis XVI, this meant a three-piece suit, a coat styled a la Francaise with floral embroidery along the hemlines, an embroidered waistcoat and breeches with the badges, sashes, and honors of his rank. For Napoleon, this was also a three-piece suit, a coat a la Francaise in red velvet with gold oak leaves embroidered along the hemlines and borders, an embroidered waistcoat and breeches with white silk stockings, a sash, a sword, and a black hat with feathers. The biggest difference, as you can see, was the addition of a short cape, also in red velvet and embroidered. By looking again to the immediate past for his understanding of court costume, Napoleon embraced color, embroidery, and sumptuous materials at a critical moment in the history of menswear, what the psychoanalyst John C. Flugel in 1930 called the great masculine renunciation. For most of Western European history, men and women with the means to consume fashion dressed to an equal level of sumptuous display in color, in materials, and in silhouette. 16th century monarchs like Henry VIII wore cloth of gold slashed to reveal equally precious layers of textiles underneath. Ruffs and trunk hose concentrated attention on the face and on the legs, which grew to become important markers of civility and breathing, breeding. Starting, however, in 1666, the courts of Louis XIV in France and Charles II in England were revolutionized by a new system of garments that brought together an outer coat, a waistcoat, and breeches, the ancestor of today's business suit. Within the succeeding hundred years, and as English, as English austerity and tailoring 
became more and more influential in European menswear at large, slowly men's suits lost their color, their ornament, and in many ways, their pizzazz. The figure of Beau Brummel, the original dandy, became the heir and propagator of this new simplified aesthetic. Men renunciated their personal expression through fashionable embroidery and color in favor of perfect fit, bodily grace, and fashionable understated taste. So if we return to Napoleon's petite costume, we see how this court costume looked both forward and backward. Forward in the cut of his suit, which fit the popular menswear silhouette of the day. Note the high collar, sweeping of the material away from the breast and the two tails. But it also looked backwards in the materials. Velvets and bright colors with elaborate embroidery belonged more to the 18th century court suits of Louis XVI than to the dandyish blue and black tailcoats of the early 19th century. Every ranking member of Napoleon's court from the very highest to the very lowest would have worn a variation on this petite costume. <clears throat> from the princes of the empire all the way down to the palace pages, the color, cut, embroidery, and accessories of every ranking court member was delineated. Not, however, by who you may be thinking, not by Napoleon, but by a cadre of 30 different artists and designers. And in fact, many of these people are visible in David's painting of the coronation. Grand Master of Ceremonies, Louis-Philippe de Ségur, reinstituted a hierarchical system of court costume before Napoleon's coronation on July the 17th of 1804. Although Augustin Laurent de Remusat was the official master of Napoleon's wardrobe, he dictated that the artist Jean-Baptiste Isabey be the designer of the costumes, not just for this coronation, so not just the Grand Abbey de Corps, but also for Napoleon's court at large, the Petit Habit de Cour. Isabey had trained in David's studio and worked for Napoleon as the librarian and painter of foreign affairs in the office of the Grand Chamberlain, Charles Maurice de Talleyrand. Isabey, however, also sought advice from a close cohort of men. Alexander Lenoir, the director of the Musée des Monuments Francais, advised him on historical costume. Ségur, Remusat, and even possibly David also helped Isabey source materials, choose colors and accessories, research all historicized elements, and implement Ségur's court dress codes. In this sense, Isabey was responsible more than anyone else for the sumptuous and colorful costumes on display in David's painting. And once these designs were publicized, men at every rank in Napoleon's court descended on artisans like Chevalier, here listed by their last names, by Chevalier who tailored and fit the costumes, Picot, Poupard, Toulet, Marguerite, who provided embroidery, hats, and jewels, and Le Vache, who helped source the textiles. If we look specifically, however, at one figure, Louis-Alexandre Berthier, cost, his costume, and then also Charles-Marie de Talleyrand's costume, in the foreground of David's painting, if we look underneath their mantles, we see that Berthier wears the green velvet mantle and silver embroidery of the Grand Marshal of the Hunt which matched his position in Napoleon's court. Talleyrand also wears the red velvet mantle of the Grand Chamberlain. Here are their surviving coats. As you can see, both coats include embroidery motifs that correspond to Segur's dress code. Embroidered palm fronds were representative of members of Napoleon's household while embroidered oak leaves, sheaves of wheat, acorns, bees, and rosettes variously identified other members of the court, like marshals, princes, etc. 
Now, the size and description of the embroidery could vary according to the individual personalities of each court figure, but the color of the suit, the color of the embroidery, and the embroidery motifs were legislated and enforced through Sigur's costume decree. Grand officers of the crown had to use silver gilt embroidery, just as marshals of the empire had to wear dark blue. Every detail was accounted for, for every rank and file officer in Napoleon's court. So if we turn our attention then back to the Rom coat, you'll see that in fit and color, the coat fits Secure's, Secure's decree and Isabe's design. The coat has the high collar common to the Napoleonic period. In the 18th century, court suits rarely had collars. The collar was only added on through the influence of English riding costumes that popularized in France in the later end of the 18th century. The height of the collar is also unique to the Napoleonic period and would have grazed just underneath the wearer's chin. The chest flares away from the body at a distinct angle, which at the time was called a la Francais. A few years later, and after Napoleon had put on a little extra weight, the fashions had changed, and another iteration of this coat could have been worn a l'espagnol, with its coat falling vertically down to the knees rather than flaring away. Making the coat of wool instead of silk allowed the tailor to iron the material to shrink and shape the garment to ensure the closest fit possible. And the fit of the coat here is indeed emblematic of a unique technological moment in the history of menswear. Right before the invention of the tape measure, when tailors are beginning to realize that pattern cut cutting doesn't quite give the tightness that they're looking for and the precision. Many tailors even invented their own systems of proportions to account for individual bodily differences. But when worn with a, with a waistcoat, which would have been cut fashionably high over the hips, a pair of white silk breeches and accessorized with a sash, white stockings and satin slippers, this ensemble would have been the petite habit the everyday wear for a member of Napoleon's court. Equally important here is the color. The coat is bright red. According to Segur's decree, members of Napoleon's household under the supervision of the Grand Chamberlain Talleyrand or the Grand Marshal of the palace would have worn a coat of this color. The color and organization of the embroidery was just as clearly stated in Segur's decree. Chamberlains and palace marshals were to have silver embroidery of palms, laurels, and oak leaves, while princes and grand marshals were to have gold, laurels, and oak leaves. So the addition of olive leaves here is a clue that this coat is not fully French, but actually Italian. The second clue is the applique on the breast of the coat, the insignia of the Order of the Iron Crown, which was an Italian chivalric order. So to fully understand the Rom coat, we must in fact look away from France and instead turn our attention to Italy, where the first test for Napoleon's new tradition came about six months after his Parisian coronation. As you can see in this map, the Republic of Italy, which today encompasses the regions of Piedmont and Lombardy in Northern Italy, was a satellite state under French authority and had been since 1800. Early in 1804, representatives from the Italian Senate reached out to Napoleon with a proposition to become king of their Republic, or rather to create a kingdom of Italy, which with himself at the head. So in May, 1805, Napoleon traveled to Milan to be crowned King of Italy and to turn the Republic into a kingdom, which you see here in this map in purple, the kingdom of Italy. On the surface, the Italian coronation was 
in form and function remarkably similar to the earlier coronation in Paris. The event was again organized by Louis-Philippe de Ségur and matched the Parisian tone, the Parisian coronation in tone, in opulence and in orchestration. The event, however, was not strictly speaking a coronation because Napoleon had already received his authority in Paris. He wrote to Ségur in May 1805 specifically to say, quote, I will not be consecrated, only crowned. What is most important, however, for our study of court costume is that Ségur's costume decree was extended from Paris to include this new kingdom of Italy and the court in Milan. However, and because there were only a two month window between the time Napoleon accepted his kingship and the date of this second coronation, there was very little time to redesign the French costumes to fit the court in Milan. So instead, Ségur and Isabey translated the costumes almost one-to-one -one, with a few key differences. These changes were then issued by decree on the 24th of March, 1805. Many of the blues and golds in the Parisian court costumes were replaced with greens and silvers as you can see in this image of Achille Fontanelli by Andrea Appiani. The B was sometimes replaced in embroidery by rosettes and the olive leaf was incorporated as well into the embroidery design. As you can see this design on the left for councillors of state in Milan reflects how closely Napoleon wanted this Milanese court to mimic his court in Paris. Notice the two intertwining branches. One is oak, the tree symbolically connected to France and its monarchy, and the other is olive, connected to Italian history. The oak and the olive, France and Italy intertwined. If we look at the embroidery designs coming from Paris directly, we find that Napoleon and his artists were thinking about these things as far back as 1802, while he was still first consul of the French. Sometime between the 23rd of December, 1802, and the 17th of May, 1804, Napoleon and his councillors of state brought forth a series of embroidery designs to be worn by senators and legislators and lower ranking civil officials like mayors, <clears throat> ambassadors, and palace prefects. Notice the similarities between the Italian and the French here. Both feature two branches intertwined, one oak, the other laurel or olive. Color really would have been the only differentiator. So the rom coat follows this embroidered program by including two intertwining branches, this time of olive. In two ways, however, the rom coat does not follow court embroidery protocol. First, the peacock feathers. Nowhere in any legislated embroidery in the Napoleonic Empire are peacock feathers included. Could this then be a cultural association? Well, popular Greek mythology connected the peacock to immortality because of the belief that the peacock did not decompose after its death. This idea made peacock feathers a, a common symbolic inclusion for funerary practices in ancient Rome. Could this perhaps be why the coat is connected in its provenance to Andrew Darling, the carpenter, upholsterer, and eventual coffin maker to Napoleon? Perhaps. Regardless, the humanoid eye in the center of each feather also connects to the myth of the goddess Hera and her servant Argus Panoptes, who had 100 eyes. When Argus is killed by Hermes, Hera commemorates him by preserving his eyes forever, individually in each peacock feather. But in spite of these literary and historical connection, it is more likely that these feathers were simply fashionable. In the Journal de Paris on the 1st of March, 1806, the author comments on the increasing presence of peacock feathers in men's full dress, saying, 
Among the embroideries which distinguish the, the new full dress for both men and women, one notices the eyes of Argos and peacock tails. The second deviation with the Ram Coates embroidery is its color. As I previously, previously shown, the color and embellishment of the suit and embroidery would depend on the man's rank in the court. The highest ranking members of Napoleon's court would have had silver or gold embroidery, not colored silk. But what would someone wear, for example, to visit Napoleon's court in either Paris or Milan if he did not have a rank? Perhaps he's a wealthy tradesman or maybe a wealthy student at one of the lycées. There was no specific legislation to determine what these types of visitors wore beyond the need to wear a, quote, full dress, which would have been a habit à la française or a three-piece suit cut à la française, with the high collar, sloping breast and tails and embroidery down the front. Perhaps the owner of this suit knew enough about, about court protocol to include the intertwining branches, but did not have the rank to wear the silver or gold. And so he substituted for fine silk embroidery and fashionable peacock feathers. Here we see another surviving court suit from Italy with a similar history. Worn by the diplomat Giambattista Venturi, this suit also has colored silk embroidery of intertwining olive branches. Ranking lower in Napoleon's courtly hierarchy, however, Giambattisti's only a diplomat, his olive leaf embroidery was done in silk thread on a simple blue wool coat. Perhaps because of those peacock feathers and their funerary connection, the suit has been connected to Andrew Darling. However, if the suit was worn by him, then its style of embroidery would match the rank of someone like a carpenter, an upholsterer, etc., someone without a specific rank in the court. And even though there is no explicit evidence showing that Darling owned this suit or wore it or was connected to it, one additional detail proves actually that the suit could not have belonged to Darling, and that is the badge on the left breast here. Napoleon, in looking backward and forward again through the design and, and propagation of these costumes, continued another aristocratic tradition by instituting chivalric brotherhoods as a means of uniting aristocratic men of merit and ranking them visually according to their loyalty. In France, this was the Legion of Honor, a badge given to deserving men of military, civic, or cultural importance, which you see here in this portrait of a French prefect. The Legion of Honor ribbon is pinned to his left breast. Note that the embroidery on his coat, these little interlocking circles, corresponds perfectly to the legislated embroidery for a prefect from 1802. In Italy, this was the Order of the Iron Crown which badge you see here sewn into the breast of the Rom coat. The order was founded on June 5th, 1805, right after Napoleon's coronation in Milan and was intended to honor Italian and French men of cultural distinction. Looking very closely, you'll notice the badge is a six pointed star done with sequins and silver gilt thread. Within the center medallion is a small profile of Napoleon, crowned with laurels and an approximation of the Iron Crown of Lombardy, which is where the order gets its name. The Iron Crown resided in Monza, a small village just on the outskirts of Milan, and was given to the Lombard queen, Theodolinda, um, and was used for Charlemagne's coronation as Holy Roman Empire all the way back in 774. Napoleon brought the crown in from Monza and used it as part of his coronation ceremony in Italy in 1805. This profile view of Napoleon is then encircled, as you see, by three more crowns, 
and three imperial eagles, as well as the phrase, Dieu me l'a donné, gar à qui touchera, which translates to, God has given me this, beware to all who touch it. Before 1809, these badges could be in either French or Italian, but after 1809, they were made only in Italian, which means we can date this badge to somewhere between 1806 and 1809. The Order of the Iron Crown also had three ranks, that of Grand Dignitary, Commander, and Knight. Badges like these represented the highest rank of dignitary, and between 1806 and 1809 were only given to 40 men. Unfortunately for us, these men were among Napoleon's closest family members, political advisors, and friends, the likes of his stepson, Eugène de Bioharnais, who became Napoleon's viceroy in Milan. This means that there's a bit of a disconnect between our coat and its badge. Its embroidery is too simple to designate a high-ranking official, someone who had been given the highest order of the of the Iron Crown between 1806 and 1809. More likely, the suit belonged to a civilian or a lower ranking civil officer. So how does this badge come to be? It's possible, given the lack of metallic residue on the wool, that the badge was added many years after 1806. If the metallic wrapped threads of this badge had been truly on the wool for over 200 years, the corrosive metals could have impacted the integrity of the wool. And yet, as you can see, that doesn't seem to be the case here. I want to end by returning to one of my original questions. Could this coat be an example of imperial propaganda, a tool of cultural imperialism between France and Italy? The Rom coat clearly demonstrates the transferal of iconographic themes and colors, not just between Paris and Milan, but also up and down the rank and file of both of Napoleon's courts. The cut and color of the coat and its interlocking embroidery motifs all point to these transferals. But there is just enough mystery to suggest perhaps some issues in cultural translation, or perhaps some pushback from a satellite court in Italy wanting a little more autonomy. Especially when we consider that this is an era before social media, before televised news broadcasts, we must remember that political ideologies circulated through materials like paintings, like newspaper articles, and of course, through fashionable clothing. If we consider that these costumes are on the one hand, works of art, we also have to remember that in the early 19th century, these costumes were lived in daily. Officers in Napoleon's empire moved and lived in these court costumes. Through the colors, the textiles and embroideries on their bodies, the members of both Napoleon's courts in Paris and Milan spread, adopted or pushed against his propagandistic ideals of empire. And with each subsequent satellite court he organized in Madrid, in Naples and beyond, these court costumes with their oak, their laurels, their olives, and yes, even occasionally their peacock feathers, thus became highly effective tools of visual domination in Napoleonic Europe. Thank you. Bronte, thank you so much for, for such a, a fascinating talk. You managed to in include so much much in such a short space of time and thank you for taking us through so engagingly um, and really showing us how your, your work at the ROM allowed you to unpack the, the details of that coat um, and think about the, the different ways in which it represented um, Napoleon's um, great plan. Um, I was so excited when I heard um, from 
Alexandra, that you were um, taking up the, the Jervas Fellowship. Um, and one of the, the questions I really wanted to ask you, because it's been very much on my mind since we, we've had these two years of the pandemic and people I think have not only been um, disconnected from each other, but also disconnected from being able to do research in situ. I wonder if you could just perhaps talk a little bit about what it meant to be able to, to study the coat in person and to connect with it on a, a very real level in the, in the museum itself. Oh, thank you for that wonderful question. Yes, and it, you're speaking exactly to what was so exciting for me about this opportunity um, to have time to sit with an object, not you know, in front of a painting in a museum where you have people all around you, but to have a dedicated space to really look deeply and quietly was absolutely invaluable to me, absolutely invaluable for so many reasons. And I think the pandemic really brought me to this perspective in a way I might not have appreciated beforehand I was preparing my dissertation proposal, unfortunately for me, in March of 2020. And my advisor, as, no, as all of our libraries at NYU were shutting down, he said, you're not going to have access to books. You're, you're only going to have the internet. <laughs> so you must look and use the tools available to you. And that's, that's actually how I came upon the suit and the coat in the Rams collection. I was going through every museum I could think of with a really pronounced textile and costume collection to prepare for this proposal. And immediately when I saw it online, I just thought, wow, this is fascinating. On the one hand, it fits what I know to be kind of important to court costume legislatively, but it's also so mysterious, <laughs> so many different um, directions I could go with it. And so to have the opportunity to apply to the fellowship, be accepted and come and then see it in person, totally enriched, completely enriched my dissertation. And it's really emboldened me actually to continue to pursue objects in person, to not mm -hmm. be satisfied with just online. And, and so I, I know you, you shared a, a number of other images of, of surviving court suits. Have you been able to see others in, in person or is, is this, again, because of the pandemic, actually quite um, a rare opportunity? Yes, yeah, so it is still rare. Mm -hmm. um, and not so much because of the pandemic, but more so because of conservation restraints, mm -hmm. um, which I learned <laughs> kind of the hard way I have delayed my pandemic research until just this past summer, finally made it out to Paris and to Italy, to Milan. And there were a few instances where I, I was at Fontainebleau, I was at Malmaison, all of these absolutely amazing museums where I could see a few pieces, but behind glass or uh, they were being conserved. And so I, I could only see them through their department photos, things like this. <laughs> um, yeah, so th that was unfortunate, but the majority of my experiences were, yes, I got to see things in person and there were suits in particular at the Musée des Arts Décoratifs were very, very important because many um, court suits that survive are of those high ranking officials. Mm -hmm. um, and as I have discussed, our ROM suit is probably not that, it's more unique. And there are a few suits in the Musée des Arts Décoratifs that are similar. So I spent a lot of time there kind of formulating ideas. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I love the way in which the, the ROM suit, as you, you so kind of ably demonstrated, um, shows all of those attributes of a Napoleonic court dress, and yet really shows um, shows them in in real life. It's not just the um, the wonderful veneer that you perhaps get from the the image making from the portraits from the, the prints, but this is what it looks like on the ground when you're you're actually there and it's being worn at a, a real court. And I think that so clearly shows that the value of something like the Jervis Fellowship in allowing scholars to connect really closely 
with um, museum objects and as you very eloquently put it, to, to have that time just to sit with an object. And it really reminds me, you know, Sarah mentioned at the beginning that Alex, Dr. Alexandra Palmer is herself a recipient of the Jervis Fellowship and there are many other um, distinguished names, Philip Sykes, uh, Chloe Sayer, the, the Mexican um, scholar of Mexican dress. And so I, I just wondered maybe um, reflecting now you, you've had this experience, um, how has that kind of perhaps changed or um, enriched your own um, journey in the, the study of dress? And do you think it will lead you to, to anything that you might not have done before you, you knew about the, the fellowship? 100%, yes. <laughs> When I look back on my kind of academic journey, I came to the Institute of Fine Arts thinking I would study Napoleonic fashion on the printed page, fashion plates in particular. And I was very content to be in that universe. <laughs> I thought that just representations of fashion would be enough to keep me intellectually interested for a career. And don't get me wrong, there's plenty to be done in that world. But having this experience now with a real object, with a, this, this coat, made me realize how much more rich my analysis became through engaging with something real. And it also taught me that as an art historian who is veering more and more into, into fashion history and textile history, that if there is a possible way to combine those two worlds, painted representations, printed representations, and surviving garments, that that is the actual path I want to pursue. So I don't think I would have come to that conclusion, honestly, if I hadn't <laughs> had this opportunity. It's pretty life-changing, actually. Oh, that, that's wonderful to hear. So as someone who really um, also enjoys that interplay between art and the, the material object. Um, I'm very glad to think that you might be <laughs> that way inclined as well. And I, I think it opens up so many possibilities and opportunities and that the, the material culture that we have within museum collections is really enriched by um, dress historians who are multidisciplinary and bring those different sources together. So we get a really um, multifaceted picture of, of these um, wonderful garments and that the way in which they would have been connected with people's lives and exactly what they they represent and that might actually be a really good point for us just to um take a look at some of the questions that the people have had because they um uh, i think have been some really interesting questions that have come through that relate very much to what you were talking about um and to i think that this was the first one that that came in um from tar and she was asking that it, it might be a, a very big question but do you think there's a particular reason that court clothing was so regulated why were there so many specific details why for example should the embroidery be be silver um why were current styles so controversial why was it with so traditional um I, I know a lot of your, your talk touched on those themes that's an excellent question and, and the answer is to really go back a few years before napoleon to the french revolution um when for the better part of a decade it was anathema to wear anything at all connected to the aristocracy. So any silks, any embroideries, any silver, gold, gilt, anything like that was all considered not just politically inept, but downright dangerous. If you were to wear those types of things out on the streets of Paris, you could be mistaken for someone you probably did not want to be. <laughs> and so the, this, you know, while generating a lot of political change had the unintended consequence of completely devastating the French silk industry and, the, and many um, French luxury industries, embroidery being the biggest one. And so Napoleon, he's pragmatic. <laughs> he's on the one hand interested in visually ordering this new court that he's reinstituting. But he's also very much concerned with the economic impact of his reign. And I think that to really answer your question, Tara, that is where he's coming from. He's, he's less interested in the fashion. He's more interested in making people buy fashion to get those industries up and running again. And this was for men and for women, um, both 
full silks. He, it's interesting at this time, fashionably speaking, cotton is a much more popular material for women. And he's very much against that. He even kind of blockades the importation of cotton into France just to try to get people more engaged with the silk. So I think at the, at the end of Napoleon's day, it really is an economic decision. And that, that perhaps um, leads very nicely into Suzanne's question. And I know you mentioned some of the people who were involved in the, or just the designing, but also the making of the, the garments. Is it, how, how much is known about the, the people who actually made them, the, the tailors, the em, embroiderers? I love that this is coming up, yes, because this is actually what I'm currently working on. This is research that I've conducted just in these past few months. And the answer is it's very complicated because there are, it's very rare to find a name of an artist or a designer attached to any garment. There are a few that we have like Chevalier, for instance, we know he was the tailor for many of Napoleon's suits in particular, but we don't know at least through the research I've been doing, we don't know how diffused his influence was. We know Picot was the embroidery house, um, but we have a handful of artists who would have been designing those embroideries for Picot and presumably an entire army of men and women doing the actual embroidery. <laughs> so like I said, there's roughly 30 people in and around Napoleon's court. These are politicians, artists, and designers who are kind of formulating what these costumes should look like. But then as you work your way down the totem pole, there's potentially hundreds of people involved in the actual production. And that, that will be my third chapter to be continued. <laughs> Have to Wonderful. Come back. I think that definitely people should, should keep in, in touch with your re research and um, Learn, learn more about those elements. Um, and then thinking again about the, the very kind of um, tactile qualities of the, the garment, um, Luke is asking about whether there's evidence of wear within the, the coat that um, helps to suggest um, whether it's, it's propaganda or, or you kind of the way in which it was, was used over its lifetime. Yeah, that's a great question, Luke. So, these suits would have been worn at court, right? For different court events. So when, when we say worn daily, that kind of depends on the suit, right? And the person, however frequently they were going to the court. Um, it's difficult to see on, on a video presentation, but our suit here at the ROM, the coat, actually was not as worn as you might have thought. Generally speaking, when you see a surviving garment, it would be worn um, in the armpits or, um, at the back where you would be sitting, and then on the buttons as well, the buttonholes. Generally, those are going to be the big spots of wear. And maybe this piece has just been conserved very well, or maybe it was not worn as daily, um, but it doesn't seem to have as much wear as other suits that I've seen in the Musée des Arts Décoratifs, for instance. So that's, yeah, that's kind of an interesting thing, right? And I'm, I'm sure it depends. It's suit-specific how much it was worn. <laughs> yeah, that, that's one of, I love that idea of the, the sort of the secret lies of the, the object of that your careful observation and, and time with the, um, the garment can get you so far. And yet there are always gonna be those reaches where perhaps we'll never quite know. And I think that that ties in with, um, Susan was, was asking about whether cleanliness was as, um, as important then as it was today, um, where, where it's still using um, perfumes and kind of notes that um, dry cleaners would, would have a, a, a wonderful time. And I, th I think we, we may almost be, be at, at time there, but um, yeah, I think it's just such a, a fascinating example of, um, of garments and what they, they can tell us. Thank you so much, Bronte. Thank you, it's been a pleasure. And thanks to you, Alexandra, for having moderated that lively discussion, which uh, deepened what Bronte uh, was able to present to us. And I, I want to congratulate Bronte on her work. I saw both her and the coat very early on in her early days at the Rome when she was studying it. And I'm just exciting, excited to see all the stories uh, that she has been able to draw out of it. And it really gets to the, the spirit of the Gerber's Fellowship 
which is to be able to expend, uh, spend that dedicated intense time with objects working quietly. And I want to thank all of you for having joined us today. Um, if you would like more information on the Veronica Jervis Research Fellowship, uh, please visit the ROM site. And if you could also help us to spread the word about this unique uh, research fellowship at the ROM, we would be very appreciative. And we, of course, hope to see you again at future ROM programs, both digitally and now in person. And for more information on these upcoming programs, they can also be found on the website. So thank you again to Bronte, Alex, um, Alexandra, and to everyone for joining us and have a great afternoon. Thank you.